Amen. Amen. Good morning, friends. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> I want to begin by thanking the Lord for this beautiful weather. There, there was a 20% chance of some rain, and I thought, well, knowing Michigan, I don't like my percentages. But the Lord is good, and He's given us beauty. Amen. I've entitled the message today, Praying Boldly, Approaching the Throne of Grace with Confidence. But I'm going to do something a little different uh, this morning. I'm going to preach two smaller messages that I believe go kind of hand in hand. Or you can view it as one sermon with two parts. I want to begin by wishing everyone here in the Hopkins Drive-In Gathering, as well as each of you who are listening in, a very happy Memorial Day weekend. And as I was preparing the message, I felt that I needed to say something about the USA and about Memorial Day. I want you to know that I am very, very grateful that in God's sovereignty, I was born and raised in the United States of America, a nation that I personal, personally believe was and still is exceptional. I know that what I'm about to say this morning may be considered by some to be a little bit politically incorrect. So if you happen to be among those who are offended, I'll apologize now. But I'm going to say it anyways. We, as Americans, have been very blessed to be a nation, and we are blessed by none other than the Lord God of heaven. I believe that we're an amazing nation with a rather remarkable history. And it's really because of how we began as a nation, where our leaders actually pledged their allegiance and said that we would be one nation under God. Now when they said that, they believed that this one God was the Judeo-Christian God who's expressed Himself as one in three persons. God the Father, who is in heaven above. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to the earth to save us from our sins. And His precious Holy Spirit, who is at work in me, and in you, and in all of us. Our forefathers actually came to this nation from all over the world. At that time, mostly from Europe, but eventually from all over the globe, out of a strong desire to do one main thing, to worship the Lord God Almighty freely and openly. And, yeah, and to do it without the state getting involved either by demanding or adhering to a state-favored religion of the state's choice and how we would worship and the specifics of what that would look like, or the other extreme, a state that would inhibit or prohibit or even make illegal the worship of the Lord God Almighty. And I want you to know this morning something I believe we, most of us do know. And that is we owe a lot to the men and women who have faithfully and bravely served this nation in order to preserve the very freedoms that our forefathers had in mind and committed to the Lord as a way of life. And I don't believe that we should take it for granted. Our nation is more unique than you may realize. And I can personally attest to this 
having served 13 and a half years as a missionary with my wife Beth and our, our seven children in the nation of Estonia, which is one of the 15 republics of the former Soviet Union. Now you've got to go back in history a little bit. Some of you young people are saying, what was the Soviet Union? How many of you remember the days of the Soviet Union? Yeah. Thankfully, it came to an end at the end of 1991. Having served as a missionary in Estonia, we worked with friends whose families had suffered terrible fates and open persecution under, the co under communist tyrants like Joseph Stalin. I think of our good friend, Taddy Elu, who used to be like, well, like an aunt for Beth and for me and like a grandmother for our children. And she would come over and help us with language. When Taddy Elu was eight years old, she and her family saw communist officials at their door who said, pack your bags because in two hours you're going to be marched off to the train and you're going to Siberia. Why? Because her father happened to have a profession that the elitist government decided needed to be shut down. And so he immediately was proclaimed an enemy of the people without any opportunity to even change jobs. And for 10 years, he went to the forests of northern Siberia all alone in that place with other forced workers under Stalin. Meanwhile, Taddy Elu and her mother and her sisters went off to a place in southern Siberia to, on a collective dairy farm to milk cows on behalf of the state. They didn't have a choice. They just went. And for 10 years, they were there. They never heard about the fate of their father and husband. Didn't know whether he was alive or dead. No communication. When she was 18, she came back. We met so many people who suffered under a regime that told them how to live, that they could not worship freely, they were told what they could do, what they could not do. Then we served eight and a half years in Bahrain, in the Middle East, where frankly you can go to prison for openly sharing your, the truth about Jesus and who He is. Where it becomes dangerous for someone with a Muslim background to openly profess new faith in Jesus. And friends, Bahrain is relatively tolerant, especially when compared to their neighbors Saudi Arabia, and Iran, where people are martyred far too often. I remember the day when I baptized Brother Faisal. He had come from Saudi Arabia. His name indicated that he actually was one of the many people who would call themselves part of the royal family, but they number in the tens of thousands. And I remember after showing him in the Scriptures who Jesus was, he made a commitment that he wanted to follow Jesus and he wanted to be baptized. And we were trying to figure out how can we safely do this? How can he be baptized, openly profess his faith, and yet not have a target on his head? Because he would, he would bus in and back and forth from Saudi Arabia to the much more tolerant Bahrain. One day, we were having an all-night prayer vigil, and Faisal was there. And I asked him, Faisal, do you feel that it's time for you to be baptized? If you do, we could do it tonight. He says, let's do it. And there we were, 3 a.m., in an all-night prayer vigil, with about 25 faithful prayer warriors that had been praying for Faisal and others like him. And I had the great privilege of baptizing him. And then I discipled him for a while. And then he went back to Saudi Arabia. 
One day we stopped hearing from Faisal. One of our house of prayer spiritual warriors called him. And he said, brother, don't talk to me anymore. I'm being monitored and I don't want to endanger the church. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. And that's the last we heard of Faisal. Several months later, we got the report that his body was found dumped in the desert. He had been murdered. More than likely, an honor killing at the hand of his own Muslim family. But Faisal had such a zeal to share the good news about Jesus with both his family and with his friends. And I believe it cost him his life. But friends, he's in heaven. And one day we're going to celebrate. Amen? Why do I share that? First of all, I want us to remember to pray for the persecuted church. Just brothers and sisters who boldly share about their fresh encounter with Jesus and who openly decide that they're going to follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior no matter what. So many of them leave their home and go to work early in the morning not knowing if they're even going to be arrested and be able to come back safely to their families. Yet they share the good news of the kingdom. In fact, I want to just pray for the persecuted church right now. Let's just take a moment and do that. Father, we thank you for those in other nations which are not as fortunate as our nation, where it becomes dangerous to profess open faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran and to a less extent, Bahrain. Countries like India and Pakistan where fanatical Hindus in India put pressure on believers to stop believing and return to Hinduism. Where pastors get beaten in the homes and churches, their buildings are burned to the ground too often. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters and we ask, first of all, that You would give them special grace to be faithful witnesses of who You are. And we pray for an awakening in these nations. Lord, that the seeds that are sown by our Holy Spirit through these faithful and bold brothers and sisters would bear fruit. That many would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. Help them to be faithful, Lord. And help us to remember to pray for them and to do what we can to make their work more fruitful. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now all of this is to say that on this Memorial Weekend, I want to thank the Lord for the USA where we've enjoyed many freedoms for so long now. And where, frankly, we should not take for granted that they could not be taken away. And we want to thank the Lord for every brave soldier who's fought for our nation to keep us safe and free, especially remembering those who've sacrificed their lives. They've laid down their lives on the battlefield for us. I want to ask, if you, if you are a veteran and you've ever served in the armed forces, please honk. We thank you for your part. If you have a son or daughter who's presently serving our great country, please honk your horns. Or raise your hands. Our son Jonathan is in the Air Force. I join with that. We want to honor and pray for them and you, their families, who are concerned for their safety and welfare. And let us pray for them right now. Father, thank you for all who have ever served this great nation called the USA, for their willingness to go 
and be trained and to serve to defend our country and our freedoms. Lord, Your Word says in Psalm 33.12, Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh the Lord. And Lord, You have blessed us with so many freedoms, with a lot of material blessings, with safety from our enemies, and safety from disasters and calamities. And at the same time, as Your redeemed people who call on Your name, we want to humble ourselves and pray for our nation. Lord, especially in recent years, some of us and some of our fellow citizens have openly turned away from You. And instead of embracing You, the God of our fathers, we've, em- we've embraced ungodly beliefs and practices. We as a whole culture have come to allow things that You say are evil to be called good. And what you say is good to be called evil. And Lord, we want to pray for our nation. Give us the grace to repent of our evil ways and to return to you, the living God. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. During the last week, Beth and I had an opportunity to, opportunity to view a movie that really moved us very deeply. It's called Unplanned, a movie that was produced just last year in 2019. How many of you have seen it? A few have. I hope the rest of you take time to view it. It's worth seeing. It's about a true and inspiring story about a woman named Abby Johnson who worked many years for Planned Parenthood as a clinic director. But she resigned in October of 2009 when she saw abortion in a very different and completely new light. I was inspired. Now I have to say, I have been pro-life ever since I can remember. During the first, during the last few months, however, I've come to see just how the widespread practice of abortion in our nation, and for that matter around the world, has really been grieving the heart of God. Since Roe versus Wade decision way back in January of 1973, and I was at that point almost 15, that's the act by the Supreme Court which legalized abortion and opened Pandora's box. Since then, over 50 million babies have been sacrificed on the altar of abortion. Now, God judged ancient Israel, the northern kingdom, in the days of its national apostasy for killing its children in those days as a sacrament to the God of Baal and to Baalism. When you read in the Old Testament, about children being sacrificed in the fire. That's what it's referring to. And you say, how could the nation of Israel, who knew God, come so low as to adapt the practices of Baalism, which was a religion which came from outside the country and into the country, introduced mostly by that wicked queen, Jezebel, during the time of King Ahab. I want you to know that today, there are committed Satanists, people who want to do Satan's bidding, people who actually worship Satan, and they consider abortion to be a sacrament to the evil one. I have to admit, I never saw abortion in that light. And it's made me realize how appalling it really is. Today we have rampant killing of unborn children as a sacrament to Satan. This, there's a book um, by Jonathan Kahn, C-A-H-N, called The Paradigm. It was written three years ago in 2017. Powerful book, which applies and shows the dangers 
of what we're facing in the USA at a national level with our leadership, comparing to the days where the northern kingdom of Israel was becoming more and more moving into national apostasy and turning to Baalism. Now I share this by way of illustration. It's not that abortion is the only sin, or even necessarily the worst sin within our culture. But because it's so widely accepted, I believe it's systematic of a great and general turning away from God and His ways for something else. I was inspired, Beth and I were inspired by Unplanned because it's a story about a woman's own transformation. But not only did she change her positions, did she change her life, she came into a relationship with the living God through it. And now she's just as committed to saving the children as she was at one time being a part of the whole abortion industry. I'm inspired by her loving husband, Doug, who loved her through all of it, even though he personally was very against what she was doing for a living. I'm inspired by the group of, of believers that would gather around her clinic and annoy her so much but they were there every Saturday, the day when most of the abortions were taking place. And they said later, that had an impact. Even though the pro-life movement's been frustrated for years, I praise God that he has raised up people who will oppose this awful practice. And I'm inspired that they just did not condemn the people involved in it but they separated the sin from the sinner. We should hate the sin, but we should love people that have been caught up in it. We should love mothers who find themselves trapped in an unwanted pregnancy. And I believe that we should be fully pro-life, which means we should be willing as a church to get our hands dirty and become part of the solution. A biblical and God-oriented alternative to this awful practice. Love sinners. Hate the sin. That's what God does all the time with us. The reality of it is, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And we're all in need of God's mercy. And the good news is, Jesus came to save us from all of our sins. We're in need of His mercy, and, he, and we receive it. Because our God is for life. He's so pro-life, He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus the Messiah, to save us from our sins, and offer us forgiveness and eternal life, and life more abundant. I think it's safe to say our God is pro-life. And He wants to redeem our messed up lives. Amen? He has a special love and concern for those who are actually the most vulnerable and in the greatest need of being protected. Namely, unborn human babies who are made in God's image. And for that matter, all of our children. He loves our children more than we love our own children. And we read in the Old Testament at the time that King Solomon was dedicating the temple, this is the Lord's promise. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We are God's redeemed people. And we need to rise up and pray for the USA in these times. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, He will hear. 
He will answer. He will forgive. And He will heal our land. Amen? And now finally, friends, I want us to move on to our passage for the day. It's really three verses in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. This is about how we can pray. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What a great passage. We are living in a time of great need. I think it's fair to say that many of us are getting pretty tired of this COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> yeah. How many of you would like to see it come to a swift end? <laughs> yeah. Universal. That's what I thought. The trouble is, we really have no idea when it will end. Our God is certainly above this pandemic. We know that He's ruling over our entire universe. And He's much bigger than this pandemic. But we are in the season, and it's a hard season. It's challenging for us. Pastor John preached beautifully about what we are to do with our anxieties. We're to cast our anxieties upon Him, for He cares for us. But we feel stressed by so many unknowns. The unknowns simply add to our present concerns and our own fears. And they make us feel weak, like we're not in control of our lives or of the larger situation at all. Some of us still fear getting the virus and possibly not recovering from it. Others fear becoming a COVID-19 carrier and exposing our loved ones or some other vulnerable co-worker or friend to the dreaded virus. Many of us, frankly, are more concerned about getting back to work so that we can once again provide for our families. Is anyone else wondering if many of our businesses are even going crazy season? Or whether or not we'll have any jobs to return to? Are you concerned about that? I certainly am. It's exhausting hearing the latest news about this pandemic and its negative effects on our economy. And not being able to do a whole lot. But there's one thing we can all do. We can take it to the Lord in prayer. And we can be bold in our prayers. Is anyone else weary of all the politics behind the discussions? <laughs> and the government decisions related to when and how much to open up our economy and allow businesses and people to get back to work. Frankly, I think it's really difficult to discern who is really telling us the truth. And for that matter, who really knows the truth? And what is truly the wisest course of action? I don't know. But I know the one who does know. And we serve a God who knows. And He's in control. Amen. Some of us are still quite fearful. A few of us are getting angry. Most of us are very anxious or anxious to varying degrees about the unknowns. And all of us are weary and tired of the whole thing. Now I have to confess that I'm pretty annoyed by some of the restrictions being placed on us 
by certain government officials as they claim to listen to all the medical experts and their advisors, and they play out the various scenarios. Yet oftentimes, they don't follow their own guidelines. Something's wrong with this picture. Officials tell us what's essential and what's not. And here in our own state of Michigan, by way of example, abortion services are apparently considered essential while patients are told to wait on all those services and surgeries that are non-life-threatening. Non-life-threatening. Excuse me, am I missing something here? Does it make any sense? What about all the collateral damage being done by the so-called lockdown? I don't know about you, but I'm concerned about the mental health of people as they battle depression, addictions, where we, we read that domestic violence is on the rise. Friends, we need to reach out to our neighbors. Some of them are very, very discouraged. And others are afraid. And I believe we can point them to the one who has the answer. And the one who can carry them through this season. Just like God carried the faithful remnant through times of calamity and even judgment in Israel. I praise God that we have a high priest in heaven that right now is interceding for us. Yeah, that's worth a honk. Amen. <laughs> His name is Jesus. He's the risen Lord and Savior of the Most High God. And as we look at this passage, we read, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. No. He is able to understand what it's like to be human. To have limited knowledge. To not be able to see the whole picture. To have to trust God step by step. Even when He's told by the Lord to do the hard thing which He was willing to do for you and for me, when He was willing to suffer on the cross and die the death of a criminal for you and me. He understands and empathizes with our weaknesses and our fears. We have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet He did not sin. He remained faithful to the Lord. And that's why He's the mediator of the new and eternal covenant. And we read in the wonderful book of Hebrews, which is written to the whole church, but especially to those Jewish followers of Jesus who found themselves in a hard place, now being persecuted for their new faith in Jesus, and sort of being tempted to go back to the old covenant where it was safer. You see, in the first century, under, occupied, under the Roman occupation, you were perfectly legal if you were part of the Jewish faith Old Covenant. But it was illegal to proclaim the name of Jesus openly. And as the unbelieving Jews persecuted the church, so the Roman government began to also persecute the church. And now there was a group of Jewish followers of Jesus who were really wondering, it's a lot safer to go back to where we were. We didn't have to sacrifice or put our lives on the line. The temptation was real. And this whole marvelous book is showing that that's not an option. That the new covenant is superior to the old. That the new thing that God is doing has fulfilled the old and now the old is obsolete. And so we read that Jesus is our 
high priest. And he's not just our high priest interceding for us, but he's one that because he was human and vulnerable to temptation and knows the struggle that we have, yet was without sin, he can empathize with us in our weakness. And he's not just any high priest, friends. If you turn with me to your Bibles, turn a page and look at chapter 7. Chapter 7 in the book of Hebrews goes into great detail about what kind of a priest, what kind of a high priest Jesus was. We read that Jesus is a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. You see, most of the priests in Jesus' day and throughout history, they followed the line of Levi. And in the days of Moses, Moses' brother Aaron became the first high priest of Israel, the newly formed nation. And a whole Levitical system, priesthood was set up, offering blood sacrifices where they would kill an innocent lamb and allow that lamb to be a substitute, confess their sins upon that lamb, the lamb would lose its life, the blood would be applied from the lamb to the human sinner, and the priest would be able to declare that their sins were atoned for or covered by the blood of the lamb. All of it was a picture pointing to the day when the Messiah would come, and he would be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, a different order. Now, how many of you are familiar with Melchizedek? He is that strange figure who in the days of Abraham, Abraham gets caught up fighting a group of Canaanite kings because one group of kings was fighting against another group of kings, and his nephew Lot, who had been living in Sodom, got caught up in that, and so was taken by one of the groups of kings. And so Abraham gathers his allies and all of his fighting men, and he goes and fights the king in order to rescue his nephew Lot. The Lord gives him a great victory. And he comes back with all the plunder. And a strange figure comes out of nowhere. He identifies himself as Melchizedek. Reading about that, this mysterious figure, he brings out bread and wine. He identifies himself as priest of God Most High. Melchizedek then blesses Abraham and says, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then, Abram gives Melchizedek a tenth or ten percent of everything. Amazing. Then, he disappears. And we don't hear anything more about him until we see a messianic psalm, 110. Psalm 110 says, David writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Yahweh the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. An obvious reference to the future Messiah. In verse 4 it says, Yahweh the Lord is sworn and will not change His mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so we read here that Jesus is not just a priest, but He's our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. His priesthood, unlike the Levitical priesthood, doesn't end when He dies. No, it's an eternal priesthood and a permanent priesthood. It's the real thing. And this mysterious passage, 
The author of the Hebrews writes this in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. This Melchizedek was king of Solomon and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Solomon means king of peace. It's literally king of shalom. shalom. You know the term shalom means peace, wholeness, completeness. Who was this Melchizedek? Some theologians have speculated that perhaps it was the pre-incarnate Jesus Himself who came down and met Abraham. We really don't know that. That's speculation. But it's entirely possible. But I won't go there because we'd spend an hour on that. What I want us to see is that Jesus is no ordinary priest. But He's a high priest, our high priest, not in the order of Aaron or Levi, but in the order of Melchizedek. And we read, Therefore Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through Him, because He always lives to intercede for them. The other Levitical priesthood was incomplete. It had to use the blood of goats or sheep which was just a picture of Jesus' blood. But Jesus, as our high priest, offered Himself and His own shed blood for our salvation. He was the perfect Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. His was complete and effective. And when Jesus hung on the cross, He said, It is finished! means the sacrifice is complete and the Lord has accepted it. And because of that, we are able to experience the forgiveness of sins and a reconciled relationship with God. So when you compare the priesthood, and and I I encourage you to go home and read all of chapter 7 and meditate on it. It's an amazing passage. The author of Hebrews stresses the superiority of Jesus' eternal, perfect, and sinless priesthood compared to that temporary, limited Old Testament Levitical priesthood of one fellow sinner to other sinners. Where under the old system, they needed to first take care of their own sins before they could even do the sacrifices for the sins of the whole nation. Now friends, Jesus is a high priest. He has a permanent priesthood. We are encouraged to confidently go before the throne of grace. To boldly go before the throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So the question is, how should we then pray? Very simply, Boldly, with great confidence. Because Jesus is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We can have assurance that we will indeed be heard by God. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15 we read, This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, We know that we have what we asked of Him. And how do we do this? We can approach the throne of grace with confidence and we can pray in the mighty name of Jesus, the Son of God and our great High Priest. We read in John 14, 12-14, Very truly, Jesus says, I tell you, Whoever believes in Me will do the works I've been doing. They will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And now, of course, He's with the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in My name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask Me for anything in My name and I will do it. 
You see, if I do something in my own strength, there's not a lot of authority behind that. But if I was an ambassador on behalf of, say, our government, and I came in President Donald J. Trump's name, that would carry authority. Do you understand what I'm saying? And we are told, you see, the name alludes to the authority. We pray in Jesus' name means we pray with Jesus' authority. Amen. In Jesus' name, with the authority of Jesus, in the name of the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, in the name of the one who is the great prophet, in the name of the one who is the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek, the one who brings salvation to all mankind. We pray in Jesus' name and with Jesus' authority. Amen? I know our time is up, but I want to lead us now in a time of prayer. And I want you to pray with me in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us pray together. In the name of the one whose name is above all other names, to whom all authority in heaven and earth has been given, in the name to which every knee shall bow, in heaven above and on the earth beneath and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of the Father. In the name of Jesus in whom salvation alone is found, who once said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And as Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaimed to the Jewish rulers and authorities, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind through which we must be saved. In the name of the one who calls us to himself and saves us from all our sins, who can deliver us now from all the power of the enemy, who is the great physician, our healer and restorer of our broken lives, and who will one day return to us at the end of this age. In the mighty name of Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior, who now sits at God's right hand in glory, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Jesus, our High Priest, who is able to empathize with us in our weakness. Lord, we need Your mercy and we need Your grace in this strange and anxious season. Help us now in our time of need. Give wisdom and help our government leaders to rightly navigate this transition from the present lockdown to reopening our economy. And give us patience and endurance despite our frustrations. Give wisdom to our pastors and church leaders to know the best way and the best timing to transition into physical gatherings for worship. We thank you, Lord, for this drive-in time where we can at least see each other and now where we can see some sitting in chairs. Help us to be united as effective witnesses of your love and your grace in this wonderful community of Hopkins. And Lord, as we pour out our hearts to You, we thank You that we can bring our requests boldly to You. So I invite you now, take a moment, and ask Jesus to specifically give you and your family what you feel you need most from the Lord at this time.
Father, we thank You that You hear our prayers and that You challenge us to come boldly and confidently to You as our High Priest. A High Priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And You're in heaven and You hear our prayers. And we thank You that You love us and care for us as You do. And we thank You that we may pray with the authority of Your name. Come, Lord, and help us in this time of need. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.